Uh, Robert and then Katarina. Okay, very good. Uh, very good. Maybe you can uh, open the video, please. Very good. Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to the Future Design of Streets webinar series 2022. Um, it's our third edition about always how to design streets, how to improve streets, how to make these streets better for all of us. We organized this uh, from um, three universities in Portugal, uh, in the University of Minho, Arquitetura and Arte and Design. Uh, the, Portugalense and the Pauk Architecture School of uh, Porto. I'm Daniel Casasvaya and I'm the moderator today. And we are organizing this always with the main question is, how do we define or we define actually the assignment of the, the design assignment of future streets? What are the challenges? Uh, streets form important elements in public space backbone of the cities or urban areas in villages, little towns, but also the metropolitan areas. They are the fundamental public space in a way for all of us. And we think uh, there is much more possible in the future how to do this. Today, we have a special um, session about technology and space, how technology actually can improve or can it make it better how we use spaces, existing spaces, but also how we create uh, better new streets around the globe. Um, for this reason, we have three speakers uh, with us. Uh, first of all, we have uh, the economist Katarina Salada from uh, the Center of Engineering and Development of Projects and Smart and Sustainable Cities here in the north of Portugal, Matosinhos. Um, she has really broad uh, background on what you can say, technology, smart city, uh, all these elements that facing also to a sustainable um, city approach and how to look on it. And we more particular about urban uh, mobility. So thank you for the invitation, accepting our invitation. Um, on the other part of the world in uh, from uh, Melbourne, uh, School of Design, we have uh, Dan Hill. Um, he is uh, one that, as a designer urbanist, um, already from the practice academia, uh, but also the public uh, sector involved with, um, let's say, everything about public space and also technology in it. Uh, background in different kinds of countries, as the uh, UK, Australia, Finland, Italy, and Sweden. Uh, but also in different kind of organization as uh, academia, um, uh, 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 professor at the Oslo uh, School of uh, Architecture and Design, now in Melbourne, but also uh, large companies as Arab, uh, etc. I will say etc. then, because <laughs> otherwise we have here a long, long list. And last but not too least, long. Robert, uh, Martin, um, original from Australia, but now in Denmark, uh, working as a head of mobility at Yaya ya Architects. Um, and he will uh, show us also his insight about uh, a new kind of um, approach in Copenhagen itself um, on this uh, matter. He focuses on the intersection of technology and development and human center design approaches. So I think this is also a really interesting link about technology and human uh, interaction in itself and how this at the end affects all of us and how we design this in this, uh, let's say most elementary uh, collective space that we have in cities, uh, streets. Um, so um, saying that uh, we are today, uh, like always uh, uh, following the format uh, of short presentation, each uh, of our guests will take uh, 10 minutes uh, and share their presentation and insight with us. 
And then after it, we will have an a round table talk in a digital form uh, with you. Um, of course, thank you all the audience to be again with us and hope you will get expired again in this session. Katharina, I would like to ask you to start your presentation as first, then we will have Dan and then later on Robert. Thank you. Thank you. So, Danielle, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about the future design of streets, tech and space. So my brief presentation is about the use of data and technology to change behaviors and the design of urban spaces and cities. So I'm going to present a specific case study, which is the test and deployment of the sustainability platform AIR developed by SAIA in the city of Matuzinhos, where, where we are located. So, oops. Okay. So what is the AIR platform? In fact, the AIR platform developed by SAIA is a sustainability platform designed to achieve carbon neutral cities, incentivizing behavior change towards sustainable lifestyles. But we consider that AIR can also be a, an urban planning tool, supporting with data, information and knowledge, the design of urban spaces and cities. So the app platform has four main functions, quantification, valorization, exchange, and offset. The first one, quantification. So the app platform quantifies in real time carbon emissions avoided by people adopting a sustainable behavior. For example, using a sustainable mobility service. Uh, and uh, which is important uh, is that this quantification process is based on scientific methodologies and algorithms, but also on digital technologies, such as Internet of Things and data analytics. Uh, and uh, the AIR platform, in fact, empowers citizens and communities to fight climate change, making their contribution to the decarbonization process visible and tangible. So our approach is a people-centered and bottom-up approach because our main uh, focus is on the role of citizen, the role of people. So the second step, valorization. The value of avoided carbon emissions is converted into tokens or digital credits by the ad platform using blockchain technology. So these tokens are stored in the, in the user's digital wallets, which are accessible through the sustainability app or the AIR app. The third step is exchange. These tokens can be exchanged for green goods and services, for example, sustainable mobility services or municipal services in a local ecosystem, rewarding citizen sustainable behavior. So this local ecosystem within a city is composed by the municipality, the city council, mobility operators, energy operators, local companies, associations, and of course, communities and citizens. And these tokens circulate in this local ecosystem as a local sustainability coin. Um, and the final step is offset. So these tokens can also be used to offset carbon emissions in a local voluntary carbon market. So we are talking about proximity offsets because uh, local companies can purchase these credits in the city where they are located with positive impact on local communities. For example, the resulting financial revenues can be used to finance other green projects in the city oriented towards carbon neutrality. But uh, air is not only about technology, we consider that there it's not only a technological innovation, but it, but it is in fact a social, a social cultural innovation. We want to bring the Green Deal to people's lives, including different ways of thinking and acting, a mindset of transformation, a change in behaviors towards sustainable lifestyles. We are also promoting through the Air Platform the creation of communities. 
uh, sharing the same values and practices, sharing sustainable values and practices. Uh, I think we are working on the transition from a me economy towards a we economy, uh, where the uh, concept of sharing is very important, namely in the area of sustainability and climate action. So um, we are testing uh, the air platform in the city of Metuzinhos, specifically in the mobility sector. Uh, in, in connection, of course, with the mobility services of the city, namely public transports, the bike sharing system, scooter sharing services, and also and other mobility services existent in the city. So by using these sustainable mobility services, cities avoid, citizens avoid carbon emissions that are quantified in real time by the air platform. And we need to collect a huge amount of data to quantify these avoided carbon emissions. For example, data about the duration and distance of the trips, data about the energy consumption in the case of an electric bicycle, data about the energy mix, and so on. And using data analytics and related technologies, the platform uses this data to produce information and knowledge to support decision making, to support the definition of public policies, to support the definition of urban planning interventions, and also making citizens and companies aware about their carbon footprint. Um, but uh, um, the platform is centered on the mobility sector, but our ambition is to expand it to other areas of the citizen daily life, for example, energy, waste, or even food to reduce or avoid carbon emissions. And it is one of our ambitions. However, we are also testing the platform, not only to reduce or avoid carbon emissions, but also to promote carbon sequestration. So the platform uh, will be able also to quantify the carbon and air pollutants removal from the atmosphere through the implementation of nature-based solutions with technology incorporation. So we, here in Metuzinhos, we are starting to develop biotech devices with the ability to sequester carbon and remove air pollutants from the atmosphere more efficiently than, uh, than urban vegetation using technologies to accelerate the plant physiology, which is very interesting at, is that these biotech devices are being developed, designed and prototyped in collaboration with universities and high schools. So in collaboration between young people, the students and engineering engineers from SAIA and designers, biologists, artists, urbanists from our partners here in the local system of Matuzinhos. Um, so all of this uh, data, information and knowledge can be visual, visualized in the Sustainability Operation Center here in the city of Matuzinhos, where customized dashboards are prepared to support decision-making, the definition of public policies, and also, of course, to plan to define urban planning interventions. Uh, for example, here we have a dashboard of the implementation of the air platform in the city of Matuzinhos, where we can observe several indicators, for example, about the trips, the um, amount of carbon emissions avoided, the number of active users, the number of tokens generating generated using these mobility modes. And in fact, this is a real time, uh, this is a real time scenario about the mobility flows in the city of Matuzinhos. And our idea is also to deploy this, this approach in other cities in the north of Portugal in order to build, to create the first carbon neutral city in Europe, the north of, to position north of Portugal as the first carbon neutral city in Europe. Uh, we are also implementing this approach in Brazil, in the city of Itajaí, 
and we are also working with the city council and with local stakeholders uh, producing um, specific dashboards, for example, heat maps about the activity of the public transports in the city of Itajaí in connection with the air platform and quantifying in real time the carbon emissions avoided by citizens using sustainable mobility services, converting this value into tokens and exchanging these tokens in the local ecosystem. However, um, as I said, technology is not in us. For us, urban design, the future design of cities will be supported both by this, this scientific dimension and this predictability of that and technology, but also by the inspirational dimension and the spontaneity of arts, culture, and creativity. That's why, enabled by the AIR platform and based on the new European Bauhaus principles, which are sustainability, inclusion, and aesthetics, SAIA and the city of Matuzinhos have started an inspirational and transformative movement towards sustainable lifestyles, contributing to new ways of designing cities based on sustainability values and by combining creativity and technology. So using uh, all of this mobility data, information and knowledge, we are working with a group of engineers, of engineers technologists, architects, biologists, artists, designers, urbanists, local stakeholders and young people in planning both uh, short-term and experimental urban planning interventions and also in planning the transformation of some anchor spaces here in the city of Matuzinhos, for example, the space of the old refinery that uh, was closed last year due to national climate targets. And uh, younger generations for us play a key role in this transformation process. And we are involving young people from the early conception to the design and prototyping of innovative urban solutions and of urban planning initiatives. Uh, so we are uh, 22 partners at local, national and European level are already on board in this movement. This movement is called NEB by Air movement. We, are, we have several partners, partners at local level, the city council, the regional development commission, uh, universities, schools with, with children from three to 18 years old, local companies, associations, and we are also working with European partners from seven countries, not only Portugal, but Bel Belgium, Austria, Italy, Czech Republic, France, and the Netherlands. For example, Climate Kick, and also Metrex, the network of European metropolitan regions. And the idea is to replicate this approach to other cities all over Europe. Uh, we, we are also collaborating with the European Bauhaus movement because the Air Platform was awarded with the new European Bauhaus Prize in the category Products and Lifestyles. We are also collaborating with Google Org, Impact Challenge on Climate, and also, for example, with ECLA South America, because we are all also wanting to replicate the approach in other cities in Brazil but also in other countries of Latin America. So just to uh, finalize, we are using data, information and knowledge and technology to support the design of uh, future cities, to support the design of future urban spaces in Portugal and in abroad. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Katarina, uh, for your insights and also the ongoing uh, uh, project and scale up of, uh, uh, let's say, the ambition within this, uh, this project. Uh, of, co of course, maybe a, a question for you later on. Uh, I can already uh, uh, mention this. How does this really affect how we design streets uh, later on? Because this is a, at the end also a kind of uh, element 
we have always to deal with this broader context, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, we are always uh, interesting on, on, on that uh, part. Thank you. Um, and then may I ask you uh, to start your presentation and share your screen with us? Sure. Uh, okay, do you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear the screen you. Okay, good, okay, thank yes. you. I'm coming over my home, my home broadband, so hopefully that's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to take maybe a different angle to Katharina, but I, the, the talks will sort of cross over actually at, at a point in the middle where I, I do talk about data a bit, um, but I'm going to start in a, maybe a different place. So um, as you heard in the intro, I'm, I'm at the director of the Melbourne School of Design here at the University of Melbourne, a uh, designer and urbanist by background. A lot of work around urban design and particularly streets. And um, I've done a lot of work on future streets. This is, uh, you can maybe guess the client if you want to, um, but these were streets that my team were involved in the design of. And I've done several projects like this for many companies, uh, technology companies or developers or city councils, public and private sector, all, all asking the question about what a street might be given the technologies that we're looking at now and so on or in the near future. And I always um, try to get in under the skin of these projects and really ask, try to ask some maybe some deeper questions about what the street is for, what the street is, is about, because we've seen these waves of technology come and go many times, of course. And um, I'll just play this short film. I hope this will show over my broadband. Um, Robert, maybe you can give me a thumbs up if, if it's reaching Denmark, okay. But this is um, a Swedish newsreel from 1935 that played in cinemas, I guess, up and down the country in Sweden. These happened, of course, all over the world in these times through the 1930s and 40s. And in Swedish, uh, Robert's Danish is probably close enough to know that it really means um, those who get in the way, really or something like that. And uh, it's really, of course, a propaganda film for cars. This guy is my hero, by the way. In the film, they call him Old Mr. Stockholm. But he's like single-handedly walking across Kungsgatan in uh, the way he probably has done for 90 years or something, and holding back the traffic. And uh, you see people walking into the street reading a newspaper. You saw at the start of the film kids playing in the street. You see people standing in the street having a conversation. And again, the coded message, I've spared you the Swedish voiceover but is really um it's time for streets to belong to cars the cars of the future and uh these people i need to get out of the way and as we know that was happened that then happened all over the world um here in australia of course hugely in america massively but also in europe including in places like stockholm where many many neighborhoods were cut apart with uh, large freeways and I, I would say actually continue to do so even in places like sweden i say even in places like sweden because you might all be imagining some nordic uh sustainable power in the north there that actually uh, is a highly car dominated country when it comes to thinking about planning so and it, and it comes from this root again the, the really this idea there's a new technology coming and the street is where that happens and we need to basically kind of get the old technologies out of the way my thing is stuck let me just drop out and go back into it and uh, what I usually show is this quote from Cedric Price at this point, the architect Cedric Price in the 1960s said, technology is the answer, but what was the question? And he was asking that at the time, of course, about the, things like the motor car and others. And really, people weren't stepping back and saying, what is Stockholm or Santiago or Sydney about? Then we can talk about mobility. It was really the car is coming and that's the technology. So they weren't doing what Cedric was saying as we have to ask the question underneath things. So that was one thing that was happening there, this deeper idea of the street. As we know, those streets in Stockholm would have been happening like that for maybe what, three, 400, 500 years in that mode. And then all of a sudden moved out of the way. So the whole idea of the street being a social and convivial place, a place for exchange and interaction was removed very quickly indeed because they didn't ask this question. And the other thing that was happening, of course, was that um, they were locking into place a certain kind of layer of urban fabric around the idea of the car and building that really in concrete and asphalt and steel. And those materials do not tend to change very easily. Uh, so it was really laying down the pattern of the 1930s, the pattern of the 1950s, uh, totally recognizable in the 80s, 
uh, culture is changing all the way through that time. And, you know, we know there are new technologies coming and going all the time. For instance, e-scooters were a huge thing in Stockholm where I've been for the last three years. Um, that's a whole new thing, and it arrives just like this. It arrives literally within a matter of weeks. But the streets are basically the same as they were in the 1980s because they've been put together in things like concrete. And so they weren't learning from these diagrams. These are great, lovely diagrams by um, Stuart Brand popularized them, but really they go back to Frank Duffy, looking at the different layers of change in architecture and urbanism and the different speeds that things can move at and how you want to separate those things out so you don't accidentally lock a fast moving layer like vehicles into a slow moving layer like concrete. <laughs> So that would be like, you know, um, putting your plug point in the middle of, or your USB cables in, in the middle of the, or uh, foundations would be a bad idea. You have to dig up the building in order to change your USB cable. You don't want to do that. So what we did in Sweden over the last three years, where I was working in the Swedish government in the innovation agency, the Vinova, director of strategic design was to do a mission. And I'll move through this very quickly to really get the streets moving again, get them retrofitted. And I don't mean how people usually mean when they say get the streets moving, or by which they mean move the cars. I mean, actually largely remove the cars <laughs> and reintroduce elements of life, conviviality, interaction, social life, uh, play, culture, commerce, exchange, whatever you think streets are about. Traffic is one of the things the streets are about. That's really not really the point, despite what some people might think. So how do we make every street in Sweden sustainable and healthy and full of life? Uh, there are 40,000 kilometers of street in Sweden already built. They're all one big connected system. They're all completely different on the ground because they're in different neighborhoods, but they all have basic layers of law and governance exactly the same up and down the country. So we did lots of sessions with um, expert groups, stakeholders, people like this from car companies and scooter companies and planners and to tech companies and the public sector and municipal planners and mayors and, and so on and so on. And out of those sessions came these kind of starting points, these ideas for what the future street could be like, building on the existing streets. But then, of course, in reality, streets belong to people. And so then what we did was we worked with the municipalities of Stockholm and Gothenburg and Umeå and Helsingborg, cities all over Sweden, and began to work with their municipalities to say, okay, find a street where we can prototype something on. Often we went for school streets, streets with schools on, because they're particularly complex and interesting. And we let the school kids do the actual design. So we use the expert groups, the stakeholders, to find starting points, really, like trigger points, if you like. But the school children were holding the pen and they were being the architects in this case, because it was about their own street and they are the experts in their own street. It's not actually the traffic planners or the architects. The architects and designers like us can facilitate that conversation, but the, the, the street belongs to these kids, actually, which is very confronting for bureaucracy, as you can imagine. I also did this with the prime minister, by the way, that's the Swedish prime minister on the left and the health minister there. So you can do this at multiple levels, these kinds of sessions, but kids are usually better at this kind of thing, particularly because it's about their own street, because this prime minister doesn't live there, and they kind of do, you know, or at least they go to school there. Some of them live there as well. So these are the things that come out of that fountains and sand pits and playgrounds, you know, scooter parking. I mean, all the, the usual things you might imagine. Some of those are my drawings, some of those are kids' drawings. And then we work with ARCDES, the National Center for Architecture and Design, another part of the government like me, but then we commissioned Lombardy Design, a fantastic industrial design firm, to figure out how would we deploy these things, the kids true, but at scale all over Sweden. So that's like an adaptable system, a bit like IKEA or Lego or Minecraft, where you have these kinds of boardwalk elements made out of Swedish timber, which can be deployed and then adapted. So the platform is basic up and down the country. Uh, the applications are designed by the kids, you know, in this case, or the street itself. This is what they then look like. So it really introduces a softer material palette into the street. See, these things are adaptable, unlike concrete and steel. Uh, this video kind of gives you a quick sense of that. Um, that's actually really lovely. This is uh, glue laminated wood, so it's pretty strong and sturdy. It actually works fine in snow before you ask that question. Uh, this is filmed in summer, obviously. Um, it was very clearly an experiment and deliberately trying to get this sense of change into the street, testing things out. So it's kind of using parklet style tactical urbanism tactics, but done by the national government. So it's strategic at the same time as tactical. And this is a delicate balancing act. We can talk more about that in the conversation perhaps. I asked the musician and artist Brian Eno to write some design principles. And there's some lovely ones here, like think like a gardener, not an architect, design beginnings, not endings. 
make places that are easy for people to change and adapt. So use wood as opposed to concrete. But also importantly, I was picking an artist and a musician uh, because that voice is equally valid, I would argue, when it comes to defining what the street is about, not just uh, technicians and transport planners. You know, so just really actually putting his voice there was also very important, as well as the school children, of course. Also building on work by Michael Sorkin and others, this is from stuff from 10, 15 years ago, a lovely set of code for how you might redesign sidewalks. But the key one is number one, the streets belong to the people. So this is this half step principle going to play here. It's not saying we know the end point. I don't know what the future of streets is, but I know how we might set up a process that can in, in turn figure out what each street might be from that street. So each street becomes a place to host the idea of the future. So it starts like this and then maybe becomes this that enables people to start uh, testing and getting used to adapting and then being the co-owners and facilitators of it. These are drawings by Utopia Architect that we commissioned. And it might go somewhere else next, you know, because trees need to put actual roots down, not living in boxes. But uh, then it will evolve again. And so this thing is really a platform for asking questions in public. And those questions, this is where the, where it crosses over with Katarina's talk. They could be to do with machine learning driven curbside management systems. That's a good question to ask of the street. But equally, it's about how do we increase the amount of bird song in the street that, that improves people's health? You know, how do you actually do this with citizens? What materials are streets made of? So you see in-street civic sensor kits, the kind of things Katarina was just talking about. But you also see nature-based infrastructures or stormwater mitigation, all of these things at the same time. And now that's in Gothenburg and Stockholm and Helsingborg and Umeå, and like I said, it's spreading and growing across the country now. Our partners included Volvo Cars and their car sharing firm. So they started using these visualizations in their marketing, which is interesting because this shows that for every car shared car, you can remove up to eight or nine private cars. So it really helps, you know, convey how you might transform a street in this very, very vis visible way. And we also did work on like, what's the value model underneath this? Maybe this again crosses over Katarina's work around metrics and data. Like, what is it actually doing? And there are multiple things they've brought to bear, including, as I said, things like birdsong diversity and impact on people's health, which isn't usually one of the questions on the table. But we have all of this research and more showing how it would hit um, positively biodiversity, environment, health and well-being, learning, social fabric, all of those things that the street can be about. So I'll just close by talking about the final points around participation. One thing that we saw a lot uh, over the last couple of years have been these kind of quick tactical moves and um, it's, uh, sometimes they've worked fantastically, sometimes they haven't and sometimes it's been because they've been moved too quickly almost. Nikita Oliver, who's a Black Lives Matter activist and mayoral candidate in Seattle, just put it really clearly. It's, in a way, it's easy to pop something up, but they pop up, pop down, as you know. You know, So how do you actually turn something into a space that serves the community over time? That's where you have to bring in governance and these multiple layers of project to the table simultaneously. And I'm hugely inspired by work like people like Ron Finley uh, building um, farms in parking, vacant parking lots in LA, or Linda Tech's work building a meadow and a parking lot in Stockholm. And uh, Walter Hood and Grace Mitchell Tata's work in Black Landscapes Matter, where they talk about these mundane things like streets or vacant parking lots are actually the places where we can experience the beauty and utility of these shared things in our lives. Which comes to, you know, then finally, these kind of questions of, you know, what are we, how, how is it that say back streets in Tokyo are like this, for instance? And it's this balancing act of culture and regulation, the national, the national culture and affinity with nature there, enabled by the regulation, for instance, 1965, there being no on-street parking. <laughs> so there's no on-street parking in these cities at all, you know, most of the time, right? You know, with some exceptions, but most of the time you can't have a car park there and that enables this kind of intermediate space for citizens to engage with which makes what i call this kind of one minute city the space outside your front door the immediate space outside your building the thing that's most intimate and you can actually take care of and have a meaningful say in because it's right there unlike 15 minute city which is bit, which i'm fully in favor of personally but it's very much a kind of a planning view it's much bigger scale right one minute is your immediate uh, front door and that, that comes back to then the choice of logistics that you often see this in a city like Tokyo uh, and I've said documenting all of these different types of vehicles and these different scales that happen in Tokyo as a result of these regulations and the culture there so sorry my thing's just frozen again I'm nearly at the end honest <laughs> 
So, uh, so the back streets kind of have this lovely quality here. As many of you, if you know Tokyo, you can, you can see this kind of adaptability. And, and I like to see this kind of participation, representation overlap here. How you see very small scale decisions at the, at the small scale with a limited impact on other people. They can be taken by the neighborhood themselves, by the street themselves. This one minute enables you to sort of really have highly participative, genuine ownership at that scale. Much bigger scale, like a metro station, that isn't something that neighbors can build by themselves. You know, that's where you need a municipality and you need a representative form of decision making. There are kind of movements up and down this, which is really interesting to think about. And it will play out in the future in numerous ways. We need more visions of the future, like Wakanda. You know, there are no cars in Wakanda either. There's no on-street parking there either, just like Tokyo. <laughs> this is in Black Panther, obviously. It's very good public transport, highly amazing street space. And, and I'll finish with this quote then by Gautam Ban, the Indian writer, who talks about these things as almost like the failure of the smart city project in India in particular, but I just argue all over the world is interesting because it actually enables us to foreground these infrastructures of everyday dignity, he calls it. The shared car over the expressway, the bazaar over the mall, that's where street life is. And uh, smart cities can't really touch that. You can use data and tech, as I've shown, in a very, very meaningful way, as Katerina showed as well, locally on the ground. But it means a, means a recognition that that's what streets are about. They're the basic unit of cities. That's where we start. I'll leave it there, actually, because that, that last slide is basically what I just said. <laughs> and I'm over time, so apologies. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for your insights and your uh, reflection in, in a way. Uh, what, uh, uh, of course, uh, you have many quotes uh, uh, on that, but the, the, the question basically is, why do we need a street and why, what's in the street for? Is, I think it's really tricky. And how, 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 how can we use technology uh, in, 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 a, in a, let's say, eco way or in balanced way, how to uh, say it, rather than uh, facilitating without thinking about uh, what's for. So I think we, I keep this uh, this thing for later on in the discussion because I think it's uh, it hit in a way the nail about um, how we can uh, use technology uh, in an, in a smart way to say it. <laughs> um, Robert, I would like to ask you for start your presentation, share your uh, inspiring um, work in Copenhagen with us. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thanks to the previous speakers. I think there's actually going to be quite a nice red thread um, that goes between our presentations. Um, as Daniel introduced me for, before, I'm the head of mobility at Yaya Architects. Um, we're an architecture and urban design firm um, that uh, generally builds buildings like the one I'm showing you, which uh, for many of you that haven't seen the building before it's actually a parking house um, where what it's famous for is now actually housing cars but this beautiful public space that we designed on top of it which was one of the introductions um, to our work in the studio on mobility um, i would also like to mention that i've recently defended a phd on uh, future urban mobility and this talk will kind of bounce between ideas that were presented within my thesis and the work i do at yaya um, now first of all um, the reason why Yaya especially got into um, having a mobility team dedicated to thinking about the future of transport is this image. Um, this is actually a, a photo taken from one of the residential streets in downtown Copenhagen. So although the city is kind of heralded as one of the cycling capitals of the world, this is actually the experience that most residents have on their street when they leave their front door. You know, you're met with this sea of cars that in this instance has actually been redrawn um, to take up half the sidewalk so that pedestrians, families with pram, cyclists have to battle for half the allocated space that they would usually have to. Um, whereas from our point of view and, and what we're trying to work with um, uh, in our day-to-day -day practice is, is rethinking the way that um, uh, we talk about, uh, we design for, um, and place different types of vehicles within the urban fabric so that we can deliver kind of streetscapes with much higher spatial quality you know, able to provide places of climate resilience, places for people to come together and meet each other. Now, our mandate to kind of come into transportation, because it's not so typical for architects and architecture firms to be involved with this, um, and somewhat of the resistance that I meet uh, when trying to uh, pitch our services, 
um, is the idea of there's an intrinsic relationship between transportation technology and space. And, and with this very short uh, kind of relational history of transportation that some or most will probably know, what we've seen over time is that as new dominant transportation regimes have kind of taken place, our cities have adapted um, by responding to them as we've kind of built um, the urban fabric to facilitate this type of vehicle. So, you know, the medieval uh, city was all about proximity, but once the development of, um, of transit, whether that's horse-drawn carriage uh, or, or, or trains, we started to redesign our streets to enable that technology to um, exist better within our cities. Likewise, with the kind of suburbanization uh, that was unleashed with the mass production of cars, um, and then what we're seeing now, um, especially in Denmark, as the bicycle has once again become the dominant mode in the city, we're kind of seeing the introduction of the livable city, right? Um, which is somewhat, say, scarcely um, dis or like dispersed um, scarcely over Denmark or even the world, but we're starting to see elements of it in new urban developments. But the problem isn't kind of reflecting and looking back on, on what has happened in the past. The real challenge is actually conceiving of and planning for the future. Um, what we've seen, especially over the last six years, is a, a number of different transportation technologies come up. Uh, we've already heard the e-scooters as part of a general like rise of micromobility. Um, there's also been huge discussions on different levels of automation, um, as well as the rise of servitization and the sharing economy that we're seeing in, in transportation. Um, which is kind of completely unlocking new spatial opportunities as far as I'm concerned. Um, the only thing is, is that when we think of these new technologies, we're placing them with a context of former technologies. Um, I mean, this is a very old kind of idea, the horseless carriage syndrome developed by um, Marshall uh, McCullen, uh, where the original cars actually were basically just replications of, of horse-drawn carriages. Um, to give you another example, I mean, we call these things smartphones. Um, when actually their use as a telephone to, um, to broadcast our voices is pretty limited in their application for what we actually use them for today. Um, the thing is as well is that this idea of keeping a technology within the bounds of existing actually suits um, kind of established regimes who, you know, are kind of like the status quo. I mean, that's where their power comes from um, and that's what they would actually like to preserve. So what I'm going to present you now is actually some images of maybe some established um, car manufacturers that have adopted some of these technologies that we're talking about with streets to try and frame them um, within their own kind of image rather than the potential that they could unlock. So to give you one example, this is uh, from 2015, a representation of an autonomous vehicle uh, by Daimler. Um, now, to me, this kind of looks like a car, right? Um, even though in automated vehicle, there's nothing specifically that has to be a car. This is what a lot of representations of that future will look like. Um, there's a, an American sociologist called uh, Sheila Jasonoff who describes this as a socio-technical imaginary where technologies and ideas um, actually come in through consciousness, through like a societal consciousness before they actually become real. And there's somewhat of a battle over what this technology will become. And I would argue that this is actually a car manufacturer trying to take the idea of an automated vehicle and, and do it so that it represents um, their vision of that future. And, and while there are kind of trees and these high level of densities in the background to kind of say that autonomous vehicles may be sustainable, this is good for the future. If we actually look at this image, that kind of realm of the automobile through the idea of this automated uh, car has actually expanded, right? So like physical kind of infrastructure such as sidewalks, pedestrian crossings, you know, they're gone. It's, it's kind of within the car to decide when people can do this. And even though this vision of the future is this high level of hyper density, um, you know, where everyone's living in these small cramped apartments in the background, the, the realm of the automobile has actually managed to increase in this uh, future. The funny thing is looking at these representations is they change over time, right? As kind of maybe sustainability uh, moved into ideas of livability. Right, so this is the same company, the same autonomous vehicle, but two years later, where we're seeing a, an attachment to ideas of livability, right? Like you can kind of see the kind of alfresco dining, the connection to multimodal public transportation systems, you know, there's bicycle paths. It's kind of the whole shebang tied up in this idea, idea of the autonomous vehicle. But as the kind of architect and urban designer that I am, I see so many problems with this image. 
Like for instance, the cycle paths don't cross the road, right? So the preference is given to the car. We have a bus parked in the cycle lane. You know, there's in the back, there's a delivery van just like parked in the, in the bicycle lane. You know, the, the car's parking is directly to the curb, meaning that you'll cause um, kind of conflict with passing um, cyclists as you come through. And, you know, I pick these things up because I'm trained as an architect, but for the automobile like manufacturer, I see this as just like, a, um, you know, it's just, they don't know about it. They don't care because for them, it's like, even part of this system, the automobile is still kind of the king with it. I think the especially funny thing is if we go the next year, <laughs> where the previous image was in Germany, this next one is for a vision uh, in a Californian city, right? So what they've actually done is they've taken that same like imaginary of the future, but just swapped around some of the signs, right? So it goes from a like um, you know a European context to American just by kind of making a donut shop, changing the metro sign to a subway, um, putting in some palm trees, an American flag, putting in some African American people. Like right, it's 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 they haven't aren't really picking up on the fact that these mobility systems are, you know, change within context and should be treated as such, you know, maybe as a reflection of like the way we think about automobiles, that they can kind of, you know, exist anywhere with these multimodal systems, which often rely on a backbone of public transportation. They can't simply just be kind of, you know, scattered across the globe in the same way. So a question that I would really like, um, I don't know if I spotted a spelling mistake, but uh, uh, one that I would like to ask the panel and just generally, and, and Dan, I think, was kind of hinting on this in some sense with these ideas of prototypes, is how do we actually conceive of and propagate alternative visions of the future of mobility, right? Where, you know, we're up against like powerful machines, like big OEM manufacturers um, that have like huge budgets for, for kind of marketing that can actually convince people of this is, should be the future of streets, this should be the future of technologies, where they're not actually for the benefit of cities, they're for the benefit of private companies. Because I have, uh, let's say a minute or so, I'll just give you a little inkling about the work that we've maybe done at Yaya. So as an architect, I'm kind of used to working with images and kind of the distribution of images to communicate my message. And one kind of tool that I've been quite successful with recently, or Yaya have especially, is the idea of this mobility pyramid to talk about the future of streets, to talk about the future of mobility where we go beyond black and white car versus pedestrian versus bicycle and understand it a multimodal mix of lots of different types uh, of modes. And the cool thing about this is, is that when we talk about sustainable mobility and say promoting bicycle use, we don't necessarily get the car lovers, you know, we don't put them off straight away because they can understand that we're not necessarily banning them. It's just part of this future of mobility. You know, and everyone can kind of get behind this idea, just like a diet, that we shouldn't focus on pizza, on candy, on beer, all that much. We should have everything in moderation. And so it becomes this tool, right, to first of all communicate that message, but then also say that this mobility mix can change, right? Diets exist differently all over the world. They change over time as we develop new knowledge, um, new understanding of it. So, you know, we get criticized that there's a plane of this at the beginning, but you know, this can change as we maybe develop new technologies that can replace it. Just like if we look at the food pyramid from maybe 20 years ago, um, you know, meat was one of the like main sources of, of, of the diet. Whereas when we have started to understand the, the kind of impact that it has on the environment and it's not so healthy for us, we've kind of moved it up to that a little bit rather than a more. And finally, just because I'm an architect, I want to show what this means for space, right? Um, this I would say is the kind of the, the pizza, the candy, the, the soda diet, the 100% um, kind of cars on the street. Whereas if we apply those principles of the mobility diet uh, for this Copenhagen street, this is what it looks like. You know, we can understand that there are still some cars in the street on this future streetscape, but there's much more space for shared cars because as Dan Hill has said, um, you know, they're able to replace privately owned vehicles, which unlocks more space for shared micromobility, um, you know, for bicycle parking, for cargo bike parking, but more importantly, there's more space for urban nature. There's more space for social interaction between the residents of the street. And there's more space for those ground floor cafes, those ground floor retails to actually expand out on it so that we can start making the street much more productive, not only in terms of social, not only in terms of economic, but also just overall uh, a much more productive uh, place to be. Um, and I'll wrap it up there and say thanks.
Thank you, uh, Robert, uh, for your uh, insights and your presentation. Uh, and I think uh, together with uh, the presentation of Dan and but also from Katarina, I think we have uh, here a wide spectrum of, let's say, well, how technology or space, how we can see this and how it can in somehow also uh, made a good contribution in improving the streets uh, on all kinds of levels. Um, well, I have before starting directly about the technology and the type of technology, I've heard a lot of, um, uh, let's say, the word data, information, and data, 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 and, and this kind of censoring, uh, what then uh, shows also Katarina, you should. Uh, is in, 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 and there is also always some kind of um, difficult question is that uh, um, when we have a pilot and we are experimenting, we have, of course, all the instruments to collect this data. But how can we, we have all, also a lot of streets where we are parts of the world where we don't have data or not enough or uh, sometimes never. Uh, how, how, do, how do we can, can we tackle that uh, uh, maybe and, and then maybe in, in just an open question on, on this dilemma in a way is do we need I mean, always a, lo a lot of data uh, or uh, can we also act at certain moments because we know already from all our experience that it works better how uh, do you think uh, on that um, I think uh yeah, I was struck actually when I moved to Stockholm from London and what started working with the city council is that they really had no d data at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, my background is a little bit originally technology before I became architecture and urbanism. And you're used to building digital platforms and generating data as sort of everything. And so it was very interesting moving to Stockholm and seeing that the e-scooters were there you know, maybe um, thousands of them on the city. I think there were 12 different startups running in Stockholm when we moved there. And mm -hmm. um, of course, the advanced ones like Voy, for instance, the Swedish one, actually had a very good sustainable vision, I would argue, about the future of the city. And a little bit like, you know, Robert or my drawings, I guess, um, they would uh, anticipate those. And they had amazing data, you know, like e-scooters know within 30 centimeters where they are because they've got GPS on board and things like that. So they leave these kind of vapor trails of data. Whereas Stockholm City, and I don't want to embarrass anybody here, but they have nothing. <laughs> and yet, yet they were the ones that are kind of in charge of the streets in a way. So mm. in theory, in theory. And Voy were offering to give the data to the Stockholm Start, the municipality. And I kind of know that they couldn't really accept it because there was no one really in house who could handle the data. You know, Voy have 20, 30 data scientists and the municipality mm -hmm. we didn't really have any data scientists. So I think in a funny way, you know, we already have this issue that in cities like Stockholm, which you might think are advanced. Um, and I really like Robert also revealing Copenhagen's dark secrets there. Um, they're not uh, the smart cities full of data, even in, in a city, you know, full of Ericsson and Spotify and Moda yeah. and, you know, super, a lot, tons of tech companies. So what I did there was actually, um, I like, a, you know, data is useful, but it doesn't really help you with asking that question. The one I've started with this Cedric Price, like, what is the street about? Mm -hmm. I think Einstein said something like that, didn't he? Einstein uh, mm -hmm. or someone very clever said, uh, computers are useless, they only give you answers, you know. <laughs> so it's like, at some point you need to step back and kind of say, it's like, what, but what is the question here? And that's something that can, I would go to those six-year-olds, the six-year-olds I showed you in mm -hmm. that street. And we, and we took politicians there and we took people to the streets from the municipality. And there you're dealing with what um, some people have called uh, thick data, not big data, but thick data, like rich data, complex mm -hmm. information, all kinds of things. Some things that aren't data at all, but are just knowledge, as you said. Um, and that is bound up in history and the way that people are and culture and their imagination. And, you know, that, that's far more interesting, I think, to work with as a material. You can use data to support some arguments or some evidence at certain points. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, that, that data point I shared about car sharing, you know, one car share car can remove eight shared cars that enables you to then extrapolate what that might mean. Mm -hmm. But 
given that data point, it's not like you can just email everybody in the city and say, hey, give up your cars. You know, it doesn't really help you with that. That comes back to participation, collaboration, you know, like really um, relational, empathetic work on the ground. So the data point gives you a kind of a sniff of a starting point, uh, perhaps. And afterwards, when you're building prototypes, as Robert said, you can use data, of course, about the thing where, of course, we have data about those prototypes. But in reality, the evidence, this is hard for scientists to hear, does not change people's minds because people mm -hmm. are ideological and emotional. And if they want to have a car, that's not for a rational reason. So the data being a rational thing doesn't really help. Not with that bit. So I'd say use the data carefully, but like the seasoning on a in a in a in a stew, you know, like a recipe, <laughs> you can absolutely use it, but it's it's not the main event. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think this context, uh, uh, culture, uh, time, history, uh, multi-layered. Of course, it's an, an really important and essential aspect. Katarina, uh, back to you, you. You mentioned a lot of data and, and yeah. censoring. Let's say, and, and I mentioned also that you had a pilot in, in Matosinus, wherein you had them from your orientation also to scale up into the north uh, of, mm -hmm. of, of Portugal. Um, are you also working, let's say, with schools, children, or other disciplines, uh, architects, let's say, to enrich this data um, by experiment, pilots, or, or policy? Can, can you maybe? say something about uh, uh, your experience on this. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, we are using data uh, and information um, to feed um, exploratory work and multidisciplinary work uh, between engineers, technologists, artists, designers, uh, urbanists, in order to plan new urban interventions. Uh, and I think which is very important about data is that in order to create livable urban spaces, livable streets, we need to change behaviors. And here in Matuzinhos, we are using data to change behaviors, promoting the use of sustainable mobility services, getting cars out of streets, and uh, uh, taking back public space to the citizens and to the communities. For example, we have been testing the bike sharing service here in Matuzin in connection with our air platform with a pilot group of 50 citizens. And it, it is very interesting because we are working with them using focus groups, world cafes, questionnaires, interviews. And through a questionnaire, we noticed that 70% of our pilot group considers very useful to have information about the avoided carbon emissions when using some sustainable mobility service. So I think this data is very important to make tangible and visible the contribution of the citizens to the decarbonization of the city where mm. they live. So another, and SAE is working in, in this area of changing behaviors. May I just uh, ask you one question. Does it also help you to um, to, uh, to talk with the municipality of Matosinhos uh, to yes, change yes. this? Is there, is there a relation on that? that, uh, that yes, topic yes. Or that? Yeah, the municipality, the city council is a partner of this project mm -hmm. uh, and is collab collaborating with us also in partnership with this pilot group of citizens and also with communities. So, and they are using our data and customized dashboards to support decision making and to define new public policies and also new urban planning interventions because we are using this data and information to, for example, to transform four spaces here in Matuzinhos, brownfield and greenfield spaces. For mm -hmm. example, the, the area of the old refinery closed last year due to national climate targets, um, a, a brownfield space near Saia, and mm -hmm. also a green corridor near the Lesser River. So uh, we are in fact using this data, this uh, information to support urban planning interventions uh, in collaboration with several 
disciplines. For example, it is interesting because we are also collaborating with the Faculty of Architecture of the University of Porto, which is also a partner, I think, of the Future Design of Streets. We are also collaborating with the Regional Development Commission of the North, which is, I think, also a partner of your event. So we are working with several stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, Robert, uh, I mean, back to you. Um, you, you, sh you show the last uh, uh, slides and I, maybe, maybe I just get, um, uh, you know, you see, can you, let's say, just to trigger you, can you imagine that that street is also just not a street space anymore, but also, I don't know, a park? Uh, or something else, because I still see a lot of uh, cars and uh, I was tracking a, a little bit because you started with this car and the movement and it, it looks like that that step that you showed and I'm it's just to provoke you a little bit, <laughs> sorry for that, <laughs> but can you imagine that you also yourself are doing kind of continuity, um, let's say on innovation in a way, it's just adapting the car but you don't get the, the big chunks of it. How, how, do, how do you see that in your work? But I guess you explore a lot of uh, also radical, uh, uh, let's say, models on this. Yeah. yeah, I think Dan was right when he said that uh, maybe architects are very good at extrapolating ideas, um, as you could see from the Street Moves project that he presented. Um, I mean, like, I have no doubt that some streets could be parks, but I'm also a little bit cautious in thinking that all streets should be parks. Um, because I think a lot of people, when they talk about streets, they talk about it as like a, a blanket term that it's supposed to cover transport corridors, maybe urban plazas, residential streets, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think it's a lot about thinking about what is this street most useful for? Like, is it that you want to have a few share cars on the street so that people don't feel the need that they have to own a car, especially in a dense urban environment, and you've put it on the street directly outside their front door so that it's convenient, right? Like, so, I mean, in, in that particular image that you're talking about, uh, I mean, it's a residential street, right? And we have a problem in Copenhagen where, um, okay, it's, it was 25% in 2016, but I think it's gotten higher. Uh, cars don't move Monday to Friday. Their people have met their transportation needs are met Monday to Friday, cycling to work, and then they use a car to kind of go to their summer house or recreational purpose on the weekend. And to me, that seems like we want to remove 30% of cars in the city. Let's just bump up the amount of share cars. So I'm just going to challenge you back a little bit uh, in, in, in that particular image um, because I presented it, um, uh, that there is some space for cars. Like, I, I think it's fine um, to, to tie into this data conversation, actually, is that I very quickly go from a point of not needing data, of kind of trusting like architectural intuition and extrapolation into very quickly needing data to uh, convince decision makers, um, because I think that uh, they can generally come along with a narrative. They can understand the different trends that are happening in the world, the problems. But then when it comes to the proposal, unless it's happened before somewhere, uh, or I have like a very developed traffic model that can make them feel safe, um, that everything's not going to go wrong, it, it, it becomes a little bit of a roadblock. Um, uh, and, and, and so, you know, data as a tool for me is actually a bit hard, right? Because I'm constantly thinking about the future. And, and, and it's very hard to create data on the future. Like um, uh, we can with the pilot projects in, su in, in some little way, but I think... Uh, in terms of my work, it's been very hard actually getting pilot projects off the ground um, because I'm a private actor, right? So I have to try and convince a municipality to give me money to tear up a street to do a one-year test so that then I can have like a proof of concept that we can take these ideas further. Mm. I, was a little bit jealous I, when I saw, Sorry, I was a little bit jealous when I saw the Street Moves project because I know of your position within the government being able <laughs> to do it. And I thought, I wish Denmark had the equivalent innovation agency that we could tie up with in that sense yeah, yeah. Again, you felt a little bit uh, because it, it, it's a national project that you were um involved yeah. in, is it yeah but um but in reality of course the streets in sweden belong to the municipalities you know so the municipalities are far more powerful in sweden than the national government is really uh so yes robert's right that it's very useful that there's a vinova that can stimulate the project to begin with you know like we 
can get the ball rolling, but we can't take a single move without the municipalities. And the municipalities, of, uh, as I said, you know, they actually, that's where you pay your tax. They they run the planning, they run transport, uh, they run health and education, they're, they're much bigger deals. So it's very decentralized. But so what my approach was to say, okay, we need, yes, we, yes, we maybe lit the match <laughs> to get the fire going, but um, in reality, we need, everybody to come together. So we used this idea of a mission, which would be a way of aligning multiple actors. So we had architects on board. Uh, of course, there's the sort of the, the, the front line there, but uh, behind that, um, the National Transport Agency, because they run the parking space law, they have to be part of the project and we want them to be part of it. Like multiple municipalities, us, uh, Volvo, as I mentioned, Voy, the scooter company, you know, like it just goes on. There's many people because each of those is a different piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. they, they all control different layers within that. So, um, yeah, Robert's right. It's very hard, I think, actually, then for individual citizens, whether you're an architect or just someone living on the street, to imagine that. So that's when you see tactical urbanism happening, which I, um, you know, I think is super interesting because it gives us a clue as to desires actually so you know they give us a there's something there that indicates a desire for change even if it's the scale of one parking space but it's up to us on the more strategic side as if you're a university or a city or a government to say well what if we what if that's more than just one person <laughs> how do we find that out now again i would argue you can't use data for that because as robert said you can't have data about things that you haven't actually done before even with predictive analytics that doesn't help you really because it's so much to do with then culture and ideology and i would push back slightly again i think i agree with robert and, and katrina that it, like the use of data but i know also that, that cars in particular are bound up in so many other things like desires so as robert points out it's not really rational to have a car in the middle of Copenhagen. it doesn't really make rational sense <laughs> even like from a mobility point of view um, so there's something else there to do with freedom and convenience and things like that, right? So that's that's kind of the issue. Like we know that the data suggests from many experiments in the world that if you reduce car parking on a street, actually the retailers will do better. Mm -hmm. Now you try and get that done in Melbourne, where I am now. <laughs> they just do not believe that data. They just say it's, you know, there's some of the, like, they're weird over there or, you know, like, that won't happen here because of X, Y, and Z. So you still have to trigger the project somehow without having the evidence for that particular place. And that comes back to then, where can we, to me anyway, where do we start small? Where can we start making a small intervention as arguably Jan Gale did in Copenhagen, just taking 1% of the car parking away every year from 1965 onwards will get you to a decent position. Then it doesn't work, as Robert said. But, but that small thing added up over time. This is the idea of it. It's a, it's a car parking is a very small thing. But when you do it at a million spaces, it's suddenly massive. But each one themselves is a small thing. So how can we use that same dynamic to retrofit those things, very small moves, and then try to get the ball rolling? That's what we've been trying to do. And data is useful to track it, but it, you can't use data to light the fire, I think. In technology in this um, speed up this transformation, because in, in a way, um, there's a lot of models uh, already uh, around the world how to say, what are the benefits when you reduce some car space in streets? And you can do a lot of things. You can, plenty of things, uh, economical, cultural activities, social activities, you know, all kinds of uh, more space for ecology and, and, and green. Um, can it somehow, if the question for myself or for our future design of streets platform, uh, but also to you is, um, can, can technology help to speed up in a way um, this, this transformation? Because we have a lot of let's say, challenging uh, social and sustainable uh, challenging uh, in front of us. Robert, you, you raise your hands. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's stepping back a little bit. Um, uh, maybe Katarina, because he it may... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I think technology, uh, technology can help, but I think it's important to say that using technology to transform urban spaces uh, technology is just an enabler, and I think technology is more efficient 
if it is transparent and invisible. For example, in the case of the biotech devices to sequester carbon from the atmosphere, uh, in fact, technology is invisible. For the citizen, these biotech devices are green roofs or green areas in the city. So technology is invisible and it is very important because the idea is that, is that technology can't uh, occupy urban space, public space. Public space must, must be shared with the citizens. And for example, I think that to integrate technology in the urban environment, we can use existent infrastructures or existent urban furniture. For example, lampposts, we can aggregate in lampposts several technology services, for example, Wi-Fi, CTV uh, cameras, EV chargers. So I think, for example, lampposts can be seen as the IoT hotspots of the future. And the idea is to integrate technology in, our, in already existence infrastructures and uh, urban furniture. So I think invisibility and transparency of technology is very important. Thank you, uh, Katharina. Uh, Robert, you were... No, we, I'll just continue on this conversation because, you know, while I agree that uh, these technologies should be invisible, I think the changes to the streetscape should be extremely visible. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I'm, I'm really trying to push uh, in our work is this idea that you know, people do love cars. Uh, so a lot of my work is about kind of removing them. Um, it's, it's changing that conversation from what do I have to give up to what do I get in return? Um, so like, for instance, you need to be able to see trees. You need to be able to see new places to meet people. You need to just overall experience a greater, you know, streetscape or else it's, it's not going to do anything. Like if, if, if all of a sudden you just are annoyed because there's less parking on your street, but you haven't actually got anything in return, you're just finding out that you've contributed to a reduction of CO2 of negative of 0.0000x percent. You know, you're not going to care. You're going to care that you love living where you are, where you do, and you can see the result of maybe not having that car space out in front of your door. Being sustainable is, is a, a little bit more sustainable. It's not very sexy sometimes. You need something more. Uh, but okay, this is another discussion. Then sorry. No, no, it's fine. I think it's. Um, I think what we found with the yeah, and we we we've only done a series of these prototypes, right? But they're designed again to scale. So you, you know, you can imagine the same. Uh, 40,000 kilometers of streets that we worked out, they're covered with things like parking spaces. There's a highly scalable platform built in there, just as Katharina points out. Um, mm -hmm. Lamp posts are already, you know, pre-scaled across our cities. So let's let's use these elements that already exist, but oh. start testing what, how do people actually feel about it? Because what we found was that we took parking away in those streets to say we did actually, the, you know, the city did, the, the school kids drawings did. Um, and people were 75 percent in favor of that. You know, they were actually pretty happy about it. And what they wanted when we asked them was like more greenery, more micro mobility, more shared spaces, um, these kinds of things, more social spaces. So, what we need, what my learning was that you need to just give people a chance to prototype themselves. It's not me taking the car away in that case. You know, it's like it's it's got to come from the street. And as Robert said, if they feel like they're getting something better, given that cars are the most ridiculous use of space, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if they feel like they're getting something better and that's immediate yeah. and quick, that really unlocked a way of thinking, which we hope, you know, will uh, snowball. That's what we, the way we think about it, a small snowball rolling down a hill, kind of getting bigger as it goes. And is it on. So, so, yeah. handicapped in, in the in the in the participation process, or is it also with let's say um, that a, a lot of people dis disciplines that are involved in street design uh, are completely let's say uh, stuck in a way uh, between this kind of enormous let's say staples of normatives, regulation, uh, best practice that's. I have sometimes the, the feeling that also, let's say, the disciplines itself are um, needs mm. also a little bit more imagination. What do you think about? Absolutely. 
hundred percent. I mean, it's, <laughs> they, 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 uh, I mean, the streets are not an engineering problem. You know, streets mm-hmm. are about culture, uh, arguably nature, but they're certainly about culture. Um, within that, there is engineering to do for sure. We need to understand where water and energy yeah. and mobility flows, and, you know, of course. But that, we don't make streets to make engineering. <laughs> you know, we make streets to make. We need streets to make cities and we make streets to make, mm-hmm. therefore, cities of, to make culture, you know, and, and the other things are enablers of that. But if you look at who's in charge, you know, let's mean, as say in a Swedish city, it's the same in an Australian city, it's transport planners. No, they're not. Now, so I don't mean that in a negative way, right? They have to be part of the mix. As Katarina says, it's a multidisciplinary problem. But uh, we do not have, if you listed the people in charge of the streets in your city, I bet there are not many people that are from a culture background or a creative background or a, actually even a design background. They are predominantly transport planners and engineers. Um, so that would be like letting you know plumbers design all of the buildings in the city. It would be a strange <laughs> thing to do in that way. Okay. Uh, Robert, no worries. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to maybe challenge a little bit this idea of this like kind of step-by-step uh, way of planning the city as well. It, it's not that I'm disagreeing with you, Dan, uh, whatsoever. Just from what I've experienced in Copenhagen is that we have definitely done this piece by piece, small interventions over time. It started with Young Gale and the introduction of the cycle lanes back in the 70s. And we can see that we do X amount of kilometers of cycle lanes each year. But at the same time, in the last 30 years, we've seen an exponential rise in the amount of cars because the city is unwilling to have this big plan. You know, they, they, they're not, they don't want to do these big changes that rock the boat. They think it's the step by step. And it, it's, strange, it's strange saying this because Copenhagen was once again voted number one livable city in the world. So they are doing something right. It's just you can see on the horizon that something mad, bad might be having it happening. And at the same time, we have cities like Paris, like Berlin, uh there's actually a number of them uh that are making these big plans for how we're going to actually deal with this what is the vision of the city in the future and and i think that cities actually need to have that um at at yaya we've been trying to work with this idea of backcasting um which definitely plays into this idea of prototyping but you need that long-term vision and consensus from stakeholders to actually say what what is it that we actually want like and sustainability is definitely one of the important attributes, but I think it's hard to unite people around sustainability, as we've kind of seen. Um, but, but if we kind of have that vision for what city we're actually trying to create, whether it's the green city, the livable city, the healthy city, um, then we can start to prototype them. Then we can start to test, OK, what does that mean at this small scale? Was it good? Was it bad? And I think this is what you're trying to do with these tests. But, but I think it's super mm-hmm. important to have that long term vision or else what mm. we're seeing a little bit everywhere is just endless parklets, like, you know, because, mm. we, you know, and we've gotten really good at it now, but now someone needs to say like, we're going to, let's just tear up some streets and really do some radical things. Dan, I'm sure you have something to come back at that. Uh, with. <laughs> then you'll raise uh, up, up your hands. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, Robert, you're entirely right. Um, the, uh, so I'm not. I don't, I don't think we'll, we can change the city through parklets. Uh, but you know, we, in a way, we we were using the parklet as a vehicle rather than the strategy. So it's a way of getting something going, like, like lighting the fire. But I think what's really maybe the one thing that I've done that's interesting here is try to bring this kind of whole system view together. So having the transport agency as involved, you know, they're in the big national government in a small street project in the middle of Stockholm that wouldn't usually the happen you know so and uh, so robert i think the question would, would to think about was so if you had the people involved in designing and planning and running and living in the street you know doing their incremental stuff but then how would you curb the acquisition of the new car sales because without that the tap is still running into the bath and you're just as you said as you point out it's just like it's filling up and there's no way you can't put it anywhere so that would mean, presumably, I don't know this, but I'm guessing in Denmark, that would mean something at the uh, national government level to do with taxation or subsidies of cars, sales accordingly. I think that's really a national political decision. And that would need to be aligned then. You'd get this um, movement up and down the system with everybody pointing towards the North Stars. And I think, you know, sustainability, social justice, health, 
whatever they might be, those three are good. <laughs> I suspect most Danes would find it a struggle to disagree with them in a sense. Uh, so I think you could kind of point those out there and then it's a case of getting those things aligned without stopping the, the car sales. Yes, it's not going to work. And so that's why I went to Japan actually, because again, you can't buy a car in Japan unless you can prove you can park it off the street. Mm -hmm. You have to have a, a, a license, like a piece of paper. It's got a special name in Japanese that says, I can park my car off the street here. And you show this diagram of the mm -hmm. tiny little underground garage that you've somehow built into floor two of your building. Then you can buy a car. But without that, you can't do it. And I think that's the, that's, that's the kind of move we need. It's like, yes, architecture, yes, urbanism, but also financial mm -hmm. um, innovation as well in this case. Catalina, back to uh, Portugal, uh, uh, maybe uh, on the things. I, I think there is a lot of things uh, here to say, but uh, just to the, the 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 big skill in a way. Um, so uh, what uh, Robert uh, was mentioned uh, in a way, let's say that in in, in the cities uh, we can make step forwards. Let's say on on, on let's say uh, less car oriented or less car. Uh, place, but if you look, let's say, in the region of Porto, uh, and having this ambition of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, carbon-free uh, 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 region, null city, in a way, we have a lot of things to do because I, I see a lot of cars everywhere. <laughs> if you just go uh, one or two kilometers around the, the city centers, uh, uh, is is this, let's say, um, I, I was just really wondering how you, in your project, are uh, dealing uh, or seeing this challenge uh, on on this this larger mobility issue. Uh, yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, in fact, for example, in the metropolitan area of Oporto, 70% uh, of people uses private vehicles in their commuting trips. So it's a very, it's a very different scenario from, for example, Denmark and, or Copenhagen. So 70% of people uses um, private vehicle. And our idea here at SAIA, we are working on several areas. Uh, in the development of new kind, types of vehicles, because in fact we designed new cars, new bicycles, new scooters, and uh, they tend to be electric, hydrogen po powered, um, ready, autonomous ready, and so on. Then we are working on new service models, and I think it is very important, and the main changes in the mobility sector in the future will be the adoption of new service models, sharing models, but also, for example, we are working on the new type of model, sharing of ownership and use, for example. And then the third one is data science platform. So new ways of managing the mobility service and new ways of, for example, uh, quantifying the avoided carbon emissions. So I think we have to work in several areas and mainly on behaviors here but mm. it's very it's very difficult in here in portugal to promote this transition but for example porto is one of the climate cities of the horizon europe mission uh, so they uh, they as the um, they have the ambition of being carbon carbon neutral by 2030 so they, uh, they have to start working on mobility because mobility represents 30% of carbon emissions here in the metropolitan area of Oporto. So mm -hmm. cities are, are defining these ambitions, so they have to, to start working more seriously on mobility. Okay. Uh, Robert, you? Okay, thanks. I, I just wanted to uh, pop in with this like carbon neutral uh, kind of point, because I think they need to take mobility extremely seriously uh, in that quest, because I know Copenhagen, seven years of, uh, yeah, seven or so years ago, announced that they would be a, the first carbon neutral capital. And what they found is that most industries are going to, oh, sorry, carbon neutral by 2025. And what they found mm -hmm. is most industries are going to make it except transport. And that no. is primarily because they underestimated the car. Um, and uh, now it's a kind of like a, a little bit of a rush to try and do it. And they found mm -hmm. that even if they accelerated um, the uptake of electric cars, right, which are theoretically carbon neutral, 
um, they would like th there's just no way they're going to make it. Um, mm -hmm. So so I think cities, if if they really want this carbon neutral uh, kind of tag, like mobility needs to be one of their highest uh, priorities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And at the moment, we have 100 cities in Europe uh, which uh, integrate this network of carbon neutral cities by 2030, which is being supported by the Horizon Europe program. So this is a big challenge, a big ambition also. Here in Portugal, we have Lisbon, Oporto and Guimarães, which is also a, a small city here in the north of Portugal. So let's see. Maybe I can mention one, 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 one project where I'm involved here in Gimarans. Now you um, um, mentioned Gimarans. Is that a lot of times we are talking about streets in a quite dense urban area. So it's a, it's a part of Copenhagen, you know, London. Uh, a lot of uh, cities where you, know, you have already made some step on urban mobility, pedestrian, bike, cyclists, etc. We are working at this moment at the regional road. Uh, so we have in the north of Portugal is, let's say, uh, quite diffuse uh, urban system. So it's uh, really a lot of fragmentation, low density area, wherein you have actually quite a functional mix between working areas, agriculture, housing, offices, all together, a really smart, small parcels, but it's, it's kind of mostly urban landscape. And this road is extremely uh, important in uh, the functionality of this region, uh, in a way, everything. It's, it's really the backbone on, and everything. But it's also a, a, a really limited space. Where, so we have like 11, 12 meters in the average. There, in, there are trucks, buses, a lot of cars, of course. And there's no sidewalks uh, at this moment. So a huge uh, challenge in a way, how to, in one way, make this regional streets that is also on local streets, uh, more street-like. Uh, uh, so it's more uh, a social space or interaction space, maybe also space for pedestrian at least, some bicycling. But at the same time, you, you cannot cut it off. Uh, you cannot close this street, of course, because it's a function, regional functional, uh, uh, let's say, backbone in a sense. Um, so this is, we are working on it uh, uh, really in the middle, but this is a kind of dilemma uh, uh, in a way. Uh, because you don't have the space and you know how to do it, but it tackles, of course, directly. It's uh, Robert, you mentioned, of course, uh, it's let's say it's, it's this relation between transport and urban form or urbanization pattern, uh, so to say. And that is really happening here. So we don't are making new things. We are trying to transform and make uh, an existing road better in its function. Um, and there are choices to make, of course, uh, uh, there. Uh, just to mention this, Guimarães and, uh, and Porto, uh, Katrina. Then um, you raised also your hands. Uh, at least you have a little <laughs> yeah. icon over there. No, I, I, think, um, we, I think we have to get really ambitious about this or, or it's, it, we're going to have... It's just not going to work. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I think you know the Copenhagen one has has been critiqued now many times. The announcement because it's it's really a very narrow definition of what even carbon neutral in twenty twenty five in Copenhagen means. So it's not really tracking the real carbon emissions of Copenhagen. Just like Sweden looks very good on its own CO two levels, but if you look at the actual climate footprint of Sweden, mm -hmm. it's incredibly bad. You know, like in the top fifteen in the world per capita, right? So because the emissions are elsewhere and and I think we have to be very clear about this with transport, the, the full work through costs in terms of biodiversity degradation and climate generally and carbon and use of space of the private car is enormous. So it's not the tailpipe emissions, even though the issue is kind of almost the other issue. So the idea that we can just, no, no one here is saying this, I know, but like elsewhere outside of this call, that you can just swap out diesel petrol cars for electric cars will be fine not going to work like those costs are somewhere whether it's lithium batteries or it's coal-fired power stations as it would be here in victoria in melbourne like powering those electric vehicles which would be worse than almost diesel to some extent you know it's like it, it's uh, the material costs themselves it, it's deeply problematic and so you know i think we have to really 
I don't think we can be fiddling around the edges. I think uh, maybe this goes back to something Robert was saying about we do need longer term ambition, not just tactical stuff. So I would, I would agree, um, absolutely. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a 75% reduction in cars in cities, for instance. Uh, no one's saying that anywhere, as far as I can see. I'm just putting that number out there. I haven't done the maths. <laughs> maybe it's 50, maybe it's something, but it, it has to be mm. a significant, significant number if we're to get anywhere near the targets that our countries have already signed up to. So just to just to say that, and you don't, you won't hear that in anything around the Bauhaus, around the Green Deal, around any European mm. Union project. You know, it's it's not really. Uh, seriously dealing with the challenge because it, it doesn't really deal with the full accounting throughout all of the connected systems there. So Copenhagen can draw a line around its emissions and even then it's only drawing some, it's not drawing consumption and other stuff. The, the real, it's not like those emissions don't exist, you know, they're just somewhere else. <laughs> so I think that's the real issue with the way we're talking about this stuff. Mobility makes that clear because it's a connected system, right? You know, but it's, mm -hmm. I think we have to get serious about this at some point. Thank you. Uh, I see that uh, we already uh, run out of time, uh, but uh, just uh, I would like to all of you uh, give you a chance to say a last remark in a way, and uh, maybe an, uh, 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 a remark that challenges us, uh, the future design of streets platform. And uh, what we take uh, uh, so we are writing your questions and your remarks now uh, to get back on you later on. Um, the, Robert, would you like to start? I would like a summary. Um, I, I, I find these talks really fun all the time because whenever the topic is technology, uh, it, it never really talks. Well, I, I enjoy that we didn't talk about technology that much. You know, we talked about culture change uh, and we talked about the design of streets because I think essentially that is what we're talking about. You know, designing cities like cities have been sustainable long before uh, now. We just kind of invented technologies that made them unsustainable. Uh, and now we're trying to rewrite that with technology, which, you know, <laughs> is not the right way to do it. So I just like that we were actually able to talk about the need for culture change, behavioral change over just some kind of application of something else that will make it all fine and we can continue the way it is. Thank you, Robert. And Katarina, so, last word so for you. Just reinforcing, yes. And uh, I think uh, besides technology, we must work on cultural change and behavior change. But uh, I think we can also think about the role of arts, culture and creativity in this process of behavior change. I think arts can be an enabler also of this behavior change and of this cultural, cha cultural change as an inspirational uh, movement. Thank you, Katarina. Then last words for you. Maybe I feel like, I, I feel like I've said so much. <laughs> I would say said too much, but I, I would agree absolutely with just building on what Robert and Katarina just said. Actually, that technology is uh, is almost everything that we've ever made. So it's kind of it's difficult to pin down. The car is a technology. You know, elevators are technologies. Flushing toilets are technologies. All of those things have changed cities radically, uh, gently, radically, whatever. But they've all changed them over time. Mm -hmm. So tech, tech is so fundamental. And then as Catherine and Robert pointed out, that means it's, it's so important that it's actually about culture. It's actually about the way we live together, what we're here for, those kinds of questions. And that's always my starting point with streets and cities. What are they about? Like, why are we here? What are we doing? What's this street for? And then we can talk about tech and those two things are really tightly woven. So maybe it comes back to Katharina's point, multidisciplinary, multi-perspective grounded that would be the way to see cities i think okay. thank you um all of you uh, katarina robert uh then uh thank you very much for your contribution uh, thank you for the audience stay with us uh, all the time and uh uh, thank you for your participation. If you would like to uh, contribute uh, uh, with us, just mail us and or uh, fill in the survey that you will uh, um, receive by the new uh, newsletter. Uh, next month, uh, we will have uh, our last session uh, of this edition of the webinar series. 
And it's about learning from yesterday. So how can we learn from yesterday for the future? And we have three wonderful guests on that and one of June. For now, thank you very much. And I hope you got inspired with all these questions and start to think and rethink again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.